Can you see my shirt? Mm. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, hey. Poppy. She's rioting. She's pissed. She's so pissed. Down with Weight Watchers. Oh. <laughs> Lie down, cute. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. So I had another video planned for today, but then this super nasty ass bombshell literally shook my world and has been keeping me up at night. So I moved things around. Yes, today we're gonna to be talking about WW's new Kerbo app. I am pissed. So here's the deal. WW, formerly known as Weight Watchers, but you know, they're all about wellness now, just launched their new weight loss app for kids between the ages of eight and 17. The app promises to help our little ones meet their goals like lose weight, boost confidence, and the most cringeworthy, make your parents happy. I'm sorry, but if watching your child develop a life-threatening eating disorder just ruined their amazing intuition around food, and set off on a lifelong struggle around food and their body makes you happy as a parent, I think it's time to reevaluate your role. Now, I wanna take it back for a second and say that as a fellow parent, I can absolutely empathize with parents who really wanna do whatever it is that they can to help their kids live their healthiest, happiest life. We do know that research suggests that fat kids are more likely to be bullied both verbally and physically at school. What's even more devastating is that these kids tend to have even lower levels of self-esteem, which in turn can lead to feelings of loneliness, sadness, and even diagnosed depression. Not only does this play a role in their personal relationships, but this can also play a role in their sleep, psychological stress levels, and academic performance. So during an already stressful and vulnerable age, I feel like these kids already have a lot to deal with. And if encouraging your kids to eat fewer chips or just run around the block a few times could save them from all of this, I can see the appeal. However, here's the thing, your help may actually do more harm than good. In today's video, I hope to shed some light on why you should be way more concerned about apps like this and dieting in general than your kid gaining some weight during puberty. Let's take a look at some of the reasons why you should boycott this app today. Number one, food cannot be categorized into good food, bad food, and okay, sometimes food. So Kerbo uses a traffic light system, categorizing foods as green light, aka good and free and you can eat what you want, yellow light, as in sometimes foods, and red light, aka the bad foods. And the up thing is they encourage kids to track every bite. WW has described this app as a holistic tool, not a diet, but what it really is, is a more preschool friendly version of calorie counting or an offshoot of their popular point system. In fact, I would argue that categorizing food into three distinct categories is way more damaging than calorie counting or points counting while teaching kids nothing at all about nutrition. Kids are really smart. If they log in that they ate almond butter, which is a really nutrient dense food in my opinion as a dietitian and mom, and see that they got a red strike, they're never going to eat almond butter again. And then we have a whole generation of kids who are afraid of almond butter. On the flip side, seeing foods as bad has the power to make kids want them even more. Research suggests that foods we associate with guilt, like chocolate cake, are more difficult to resist overeating. Do we really need to have kids binging not only on cake, but almond butter in secret? Hell no. Number two, the nutrition recommendations themselves are bullshit. Now this is a bit of a moot point because like I said before, we should not be categorizing foods as good food, bad food, and kind of bad food, but I'm legit so confused about what the criteria was for these categories. Under the traffic light system, my son's breakfast of full fat plain Greek yogurt with some banana on top and a slice of sourdough bread with some almond butter would rack up a whopping three red stripes. What the actual f I don't know about you, but that is a really nutrient dense meal in my books. And I would be so proud as a mom to see my son gobble that whole thing up and then ask for seconds. But nope, WW Kerbo app is teaching our kids to fear any food that is not fat free, salt free, flavor free, and calorie free. Let's be real. This is a calorie game. Number three, dieting increases eating disorder risk in children. The words diet, 
and children should really never be going together. And the research does confirm to us why this is. So first of all, in general, diets don't work. You know, you hear me say this all the time, but the research suggests that 90 to 95% of people will regain that weight right back. It's just not sustainable. The same goes for children. In a 2017 Cochrane review, researchers found that weight loss interventions in children between the ages of five and 11 did result in some modest weight loss. None of it was maintainable long-term. In addition, the researchers found that a lot of these studies that did have weight loss success with their children and their weight loss interventions had major study flaws. Yet Kerbo uses a lot of these same studies to cite evidence in support of their program. Big fail. What Kerbo fails to mention is that what dieting does is lock people into a lifetime of weight cycling, also known as yo-yo dieting. The research suggests that going up and down and up and down your weight is way more dangerous and detrimental to your health than just always kind of maintaining a higher BMI. In fact, this type of high stress on your body has been shown to increase your risk of high blood pressure, inflammation, and even early death. Not only that, but weight cycling can also be really emotionally stressful as well. It's that constant battle and give and take between feeling kind of ashamed of your body and food choices, that temporarily kind of feeling of satisfaction when you finally lose a few pounds, and then that overwhelming guilt and shame that comes when inevitably you gain that weight back. Furthermore, research suggests that children who are a victim of weight stigma are more likely to avoid just basic healthy behaviors like exercise, which in turn can perpetuate any of that weight gain. Since Kerbo blatantly stigmatizes people in bigger bodies and automatically suggests weight loss as the cure, kids are bound to feel badly about themselves and potentially could turn to dangerous coping mechanisms like substance abuse, disengagement, and weight cycling. Most problematically is that children and adults who go on diets are at higher risk of developing an eating disorder. Not only does this interfere with our innate body wisdom, our ability to kind of hone in on our hunger and satiety cues, but heavily restricting calories is bound to be followed by a binge when we inevitably slip up. So we engage in this restrict, binge, repent, repeat cycle that literally goes on for life. Early dieters tend to have higher risks of eating disorder behaviors like severely restricting calories, excessive exercise, vomiting, using laxatives, and other diet pills. Yet our society applauds these dieting behaviors as virtuous while turning a blind eye to these life-threatening behaviors. And when I say life-threatening, I mean it. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rates of all mental health disorders, even depression. Wake up. Kerbo is the gateway drug to this all. Number four, preteens and teens need to gain weight and fat. You know our society is so fat phobic when we are terrified of our children gaining weight in a way that is imperative to their health and well-being. First of all, the way that our body processes and holds onto fat is largely genetic. Some people will gain more fat than others, even if the eating environment is the exact same. Some people have more fat in their bum, some people have it in their legs, some people have store it in their bellies. We're all so different. So considering that we can appreciate that we all have a different genetic makeup, the same way that we have different colored hair, different colored eyes, I don't understand why we cannot really wrap our head around the idea of us also just having a different body composition as well. Despite our society's overwhelming fear of fat, it's actually really important. Body fat is so key for keeping our organs protected, temperature regulation, cell signaling, and hormone regulation, just to name a few perks. In children, body fat plays a really important role in growth and development. So during puberty, uh, fat actually signals the development of a lot of our sex hormones like testosterone for boys and estrogen and progesterone for girls, which in turn play a role in you know, getting taller, um, breast development, menstruation, body hair, etc. In girls, having sufficient fat stores is really important to helping to develop and maintain a healthy menstrual cycle. If fat stores get too low and nutrient stores in general are insufficient, this can stunt sexual maturation. Unfortunately, a lot of young girls who try to stunt their natural weight gain are at risk of delayed period, and it may take a long time to resume normal growth. 
body size and shape are like eye color. We are all so different and we would never shame our child for having brown eyes or try to will them into trying to make them blue. It is so cruel to me that any parent would want to change their eight-year-old child, especially when we know the risks of doing so and that those changes are temporary at best. Number five, the Kerbo app promotes fat phobia. I think one of the most disturbing parts of the Kerbo app are the before and after photos of these young children and the success stories, which honestly are creepy as f and just really sad to read. Vanessa is eight years old and has lost 11 BMI points. And her mom says that watching Vanessa say no to unhealthy foods that she otherwise and previously would never have said no to before has really surprised her. I'm amazed at Vanessa's willpower and motivation. Let that one sink in. Oh. Diet culture makes us believe that in order to change our body, it just comes down to a little bit of simple willpower. But the reality is that for that poor little girl, she's probably fighting so hard and falling so deep into disorderly thoughts that she doesn't even know how to trust her body or food anymore. Number six, weight stigma and weight cycling is a much bigger problem than weight itself. Now, if you're standing there and thinking, oh, well, it's just for their health. We wanna do it to better their health. Let me tell you, that is bullshit, and the research makes it clear. In fact, all of your dieting efforts will just have a really negative impact on their health. Pressure to lose weight and achieve unrealistic beauty standards is not going to help a person achieve good health. In fact, research suggests that weight is not associated with mortality as much as fitness is, regardless of how much that fitness or kind of activity level increases or decreases a person's weight. The same is true for diet. A meta-analysis of the research found that dietary interventions like increasing fiber uh, or following a more of like a Mediterranean style diet was associated with reducing the risk of diabetes as well as improving blood cholesterol, blood sugar, and blood pressure levels, even if it did not impact the person's weight. Meanwhile, when a person experiences weight stigma, which is judgment around their size, they're much more likely to engage in unhealthy eating behaviors, avoid seeing a doctor, and disengage from social behavior behaviors and activities. In contrast, when people feel confident in their body, they're much more likely to engage in healthy lifestyle behaviors and feel in control of their health, regardless of their size or weight. In a systematic review, researchers found that interventions that focus more on health behaviors, like healthy eating, intuitive eating, um, physical activity, were much more likely to impact health outcomes like reducing the risk of heart disease and depression. Meanwhile, diets and interventions that focused on restriction or body weight showed little to no improvements on health. So what does this all mean? It means that we need to focus on our behaviors, not our weight and not our size when it comes to promoting health. And number seven, diets just don't work. My morning email from my Kerbo app told me that 90% of kids using the Kerbo coach system will lose weight within three months, an upgrade that will cost you $69 per month. But what they don't tell us is how quickly these kids are gonna gain all that weight back and then some. Weight loss companies love to show before and after photos, but what they don't show us is follow-up photos a few months or even years later. What we know is that sure, it's pretty easy to lose some pounds on a crash diet, but 90 to 95% of people will gain that weight back and usually even more so within months or years later. Just take a look at The Biggest Loser as an example. One 2016 study found that participants gained almost all of the weight back uh, and their metabolisms got so up that they were eating less calories but still creeping back up to their original weights. Even Oprah, who is a paid ambassador of Weight Watchers program, cannot seem to maintain her weight loss on the program at different stages in her life. While many people go on diets to improve their health, the research consistently shows us that they're just not the solution and can often do a lot more harm than good. So with all that said, what should we be doing instead? Look, I totally understand the concern around our children's health. I'm a mom too, but we really need to be focusing on sustainable long-term behaviors that promote a healthy relationship with food and body image. If the research has told us anything, it's that diets do not work and they do not belong anywhere near our children. So number one, instead of restricting food and vilifying it, let's work with our kids to develop their intuitive eating skills. 
We need to get rid of the moral judgment and the dichotomies around good food and bad food and really work towards using more neutral language. So for example, instead of saying, eat your broccoli, it's good for you, why don't you say, we love broccoli, it's so delicious and it helps us grow. Number two, you have to model a healthy relationship with food. Never associate certain foods with your body or your worth. So avoid using phrases like, oh my God, I've been so bad, I shouldn't have the cake, or I'm just too fat as it is to eat pie. These statements not only perpetuate weight stigma and fat phobia, but they also teach our kids that our worth is derived from the food that we eat. So instead, try talking about fun food as being pleasurable. So for example, saying, grandma baked this cake or pie with so much love, I'm sure it's going to be delicious, let's enjoy it together as a family. Number three, I also recommend teaching our kids to appreciate all of the amazing things that our bodies can do, running and lifting and jumping and climbing. This helps show our kids that their bodies, regardless of their size or shape, are capable of doing amazing things. Finally, we want to lead by example and denounce diet culture. It's really important that we never criticize our body, their body, or anybody else's bodies. And we wanna teach our kids that bodies come in all different sizes and shapes. Research suggests that when a parent openly discusses their dissatisfaction with their own body, the child is more likely to die in the future. We need to breed a new generation of children and eventual adults who love and respect all bodies regardless of size or shape, not ones who loathe and fear their bodies when they eventually no longer maintain a size two. Okay, let's call it Kerbo for what it really is, a money-hungry attempt to hook customers for life with fat phobia and disordered eating behaviors and thoughts. The best predictor of weight gain is dieting. So that coupled with weight stigma, weight cycling, and disordered eating that go hand in hand with diets, this app has the real potential to turn a non-problem into a real problem really fast. If WW was actually interested in improving our children's health, its coaching would not be set at a premium price where only the wealthy have access to it. It wouldn't promote a lifetime of dieting. It wouldn't be calling almond butter unhealthy. And it wouldn't be teaching our children that there's inherently something wrong with their body. Wake the f up Weight Watchers. Please pull this app off the market today. So everybody, if this all sounds familiar to you and Weight Watchers was kind of the hook that dragged you into a lifetime of diet culture and dieting and weight cycling, um, if you feel so inclined, I would love to hear from you in the comment section below. I know this is a very sensitive topic, but also a real relatable topic. I hear this from so many people. Um, so please feel free to share. Um, as always, like this video, subscribe to the channel, share the shit out of it because we need to take this shit down. And on that note, I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Thanks so much. Bye.